couple of things before I start. One is uh, all the mystery projects have been graded and returned back to you. Okay? And a couple of things about the mystery project. As you recognize, this is a project about dealing with a lot of data. It's very different from your intrinsic valuation, which is about understanding the mechanics of value. This is about money ball with data. How do you deal with a lot of data? And obviously, given the push, and this is understandable, would that in class towards regressions and statistics, that's where you all went. I think, I think there were two groups that did not use regressions. Everybody else used regressions. And one of the things I saw in the project is how much your statistics class actually stuck. I mean, simple things like, you know, how big a sample size. See, when you run a regression, you start adding variables into the regression. It's almost by definition your R squared is going to go up. So if you have 7 instead of 4, 9 instead of 7. There's a catch, though. If you have a sample size of 183, which is what I think your entire sample size was, you have to be careful about not getting carried away. And it showed up in some of you actually broke your sample down into subgroups, which actually makes intuitive sense. You say, I'm going to look at it in seven different sectors. And I'm going to run regressions in each one. Kudos to you. Nice thinking. But then if you ran regressions with five variables in them in each sector, you're going to have a problem because you have sample size of 2730. And there's a very simple rule of thumb. Here's my rule. If for every 15 observations, you're allowed one independent variable. You see where this is going? If you have 30 in your sample, stop with two. And this is more about your big project than about the mystery project. Because some of you, when you do your relative valuation for your companies, which you have to get done, get it done out of the way. It doesn't take much time. Your sample size are often going to be 15, 16, 17 companies. So if you adopt my rule, your regression, if you decide to run one, can have only one independent variable. Don't throw in three or five. It'll blow up your regression. You can get great looking regressions, but they'll mean absolutely nothing. The second part of the project asks you to do what? Find a target for an activist investor, right? The first thing you need to do anytime you're asked to find a target with any kind of mission is tell me what you are looking for before you go looking. Okay? And one of the things, again, that came through was many of you were looking for companies where you could borrow a lot of money. Okay, that's, that's a piece of, the, of, the, of this process. You want to borrow money. Why? Because you want to take advantage of the tax laws and make. But there are three words in an LBO. There's an L and a B and an O. I know this is obvious. The L is the leverage part. The B is what? Buyout part, where you're taking a public company private. And the O, I have no idea. So I guess it's a BO is about. There's a leverage part. And why do you want to take a public company private? What do you want to do with it as a private company? I mean, clearly, both public and private companies get the benefits of leverage. So the leverage reason is not what's making you go private. It's you want to change something about the company, right? Break it up, run it differently. And that's the piece I was looking for in the second part, is were you looking for things in your company that you could fix? Which means your typical target company should be one that's well run or badly run. It should be a badly run company because it's a well run company. What the heck are you bringing to the table? And do you have to use leverage? You don't have to. I don't think that's a requirement. But if you look for leverage and you look for a company that's badly managed, well, you get both things working for you. But what I'm arguing for is separate the two. You can have buyouts where leverage might not make sense. You can have leverage where buyouts don't make sense. You can have leverage buyouts where both make sense. But let's not bundle them together. And if you get a chance, read that paper I have on LBOs. Because what I did was I took Harman Audio. You've seen those speakers in the high end. They were targeted by two very big names for an LBO, Goldman Sachs and KKR. You're saying, those names, they must know what they're doing. So actually, if you take the Harman deal apart, basically what I look at is I look at the company and say, does this company fit the characteristics of what you'd go looking for in an LBO? Can it carry that? The answer with Harman is not really. It's a company that has margins much higher than the sector. So what are you going to fix? Earns a return on capital 10% above the cost of capital. So what are you going to fix? So my conclusion at the end of the analysis is, this company doesn't make sense for me as a target in an LBO because none of the characteristics fit. 
So the next time you see a company targeted in an LBO in a news story, take it apart yourself. Don't assume that just because there are big names involved in the deal, that somehow the deal makes sense. Should I talk about today's quiz? Might as well mention a couple of things. Okay. Much of the quiz was actually like past quizzes, right? The first problem, very much like a problem from a previous quiz with one small twist, which was? I threw the options in. With every item there, the only question you face is add, subtract, or ignore. Add, subtract, or ignore. Add, subtract, or ignore, right? Three choices. And most of you didn't even think about the ignore, so it's add or subtract, add or subtract. That's all I'm looking for. Did you add something you should have subtracted? Subtract them, something you should have added. And for the most part, as I said, this might open up wounds, but let's do it anyway. Okay? So you have share price times number of shares. So I assume that everybody multiplied the two. That's your starting point, market cap. You have to get from market cap to enterprise value. So I'm going to go item by item. Tell me whether you added, subtracted, or didn't even see the item. OK, ready? Market cap, debt. Add, add. OK, everybody got it, except for two people there. I don't know. <laughs> Cash. OK, good. We're on a, on a roll here. Minority holdings. Oh, we're going to get some. I, already I know what I have to look for. Why do you have to subtract it out? Because the income from those holdings are not part of your EBITDA, right? You subtract out. Minority interest. Add, subtract, add. Now comes the one that I know that I, I was looking at the answers. This was your weakest link. Option value. Add or subtract. Actually, add. Yeah, I, I was so close. How? What the hell do you mean you were so close? <laughs> you either. This is a zero-one problem, and here's why you have to you have to add. The way, the reason you, I know why you subtract because in intrinsic valuation, what do you do? You come up with the value of the equity, then you subtract out to get to the value of equity in the shares, and you divide by the number of shares. In a, in a sense, you're working backwards through that table, right? That's what this whole process is. The market cap is the value of equity in your common stock. So in the case of Square, you take share price times number of shares, you know, whatever the price was, you come up with about $3 billion. But there are 112 million options there, right? Those options are value. The actual market value of equity at Square is about 30% higher than the market cap because that market value of options is not reflecting the market cap. When you buy these shares, you're already reflecting those options. The rest of the problems, I think, were pretty much what you've seen before. The second one was a little bit of mechanical stuff you had to do. The third and the fourth, I thought, were pretty much working with, if you got the equation that you were working with right, the price to book equation for a bank, and the total beta equation for the last one, the rest kind of flow. So the usual rules apply. You know, none of you is going to pick up your quiz because you're all off for Thanksgiving right after this class is over. Some of you have already left. Okay. That's OK. Yeah. So I will leave it out. until I'll actually take it in tomorrow because God only knows what happens in these buildings during Thanksgiving weekend. I think there are parties here. The janitors get together. Okay. So I will bring it back outside next week. So if you want to pick it up, it'll be out tomorrow probably. Come and pick it up if not. Not a big deal. So as I promised, what I'm going to do in these last 37 minutes of class is take everything I know about options, which thank God is not a lot, and fit it into 37 minutes. So think of this as a very speedy introduction to the next topic on our agenda. It's what's called real options. It is, in fact, one of the hardest areas in corporate finance and valuation. In a minute, you're going to see why. To show you how hot real options are. I remember at 15 years ago getting on, I think it was the version of Amazon that existed then, and doing a search for books on real options. And I think there was one book maybe on real options, perhaps two. Today, if you type in the word real options, you'll see about 50 books pop up on real options on any online bookstore. You go into any consulting firm, there's a real options group that's in there. Some equity research departments have real options specialists. Real options have become a bit of an obsession for people who think of themselves as advanced finance people. And that scares the heck out of me. Because in finance, we have this really bad habit of taking the obvious 
and claiming the absurd. Pushing it to a level where it becomes outrageous. And real options, in a sense, have been hijacked by the purists. You know what the purists are? These are the people who believe in real options to the point that everything they look at is a real option. I mean, it reminds me of what Charlie Munger once said. If the only tool you have is a hammer, after a while, everything starts to look like a nail. That's what these real options people do. They look at everything. That looks like an option. That looks like one. So I'm going to give you up front what I, where I'm coming from. I believe in real options. In fact, I had a chapter in real options 20 years ago in my first edition of my valuation book. But I'm a bit of a cynic when I look at how real options get applied in practice. And hopefully I can give you some ammunition if you run into one of these real options people on what questions to ask them to see if, in fact, there is a real option embedded in some argument. So here are some of the places where you'll see real options pop up. You'll see an investment that doesn't look good today, and there'll be talk about delaying that investment. There's a real option in there. If you have production schedules in a factory, adjusting the schedules, or it could be in an energy company, there's a real option in there. If you're investing in a new market, let's say China, cloud computing, bigger the market, the more valuable the option is, there's talk of real options. In fact, when people talk about strategic considerations, they're really talking about real options. They're saying, we know we lose money in China, but it's OK, because there's a strategic consideration. Today, we're actually, or not today, but in the sessions to come, we're actually going to look at whether there is, in fact, an option. And there is, in fact, in some big markets, an optionality that might let you pay a bigger amount for that particular investment. So the advantage of real options, and this is what makes them so attractive to people who push them, is you know how in discounted cash flow evaluation you come up with a value for an asset, present value of cash flows. When you do capital budgeting, you take a net present value. And the rule in capital budgeting is the net present value is negative, don't take the investment. If the value is less than the price, don't buy the stock. If you buy into a real options argument, you can break those rules. Those rules are viewed as fundamental rules in finance. You can't get away with breaking them. If you're making a real options argument, what you're saying is there's a premium on top of my DCF. So if I value a biotechnology company and I come up with a value of $3, if there is a real options argument to be made and it's made legitimately, you might pay a $2 premium or a $3 premium over and above your DCF value. And that is an immense advantage if you're pushing an investment, right? You, you take the value and say, we should pay a premium. So that's a way to think about real options. I'm going to start this process with a very simplistic example. It's not a finance example. It comes from probability and statistics. So let's assume I came to you with an investment where there's a 50% chance of success and a 50% chance of failure. If you succeed, you make 100 million. If you fail, you lose 120 million. What's the expected value of this investment? Minus 10, right? 0. 0.5 times 100 plus point. So you're saying it's a bad investment. Now I'm going to take the same investment and make it into a slightly different kind of investment. It's now going to become a two-stage investment. In the first stage, there's a 75% chance of success and a 25% chance of failure. If you fail at the first stage, you stop and you lose 20 million. If you succeed at the first stage, you continue and there's a two-thirds chance of success where you'll make an 80 million, and a one-third chance of failure where you lose 100 million. You see the resemblance between the two investments? My upside is still 100. My downside is still 120. There's a 50% chance of success and a 50% chance of failure. At least at a very peripheral level, these investments look equivalent, right? But if you compute the expected value of this investment, you can try it if you want, you will get a positive number. So what happens between the two examples to make a negative investment to a positive investment? What is the advantage I gain when I do this investment in two stages? What happens in the first stage? I get an early, it's like a market testing, right? I get an early snapshot of whether this is an investment I should throw more money in. And if that early signal that I get is a negative signal, what do I do? I stop. If I get a positive signal, I continue. There are two words on which real option arguments are built on. The first is what I call learning, which is you observe what's happening around you, and you learn about your project. You learn something about your project. 
And the second is what I call adaptive behavior, which is based on that learning, you change the way you behave. You say, who cares? We're talking about valuation. This looks like some probability tree. Let's assume you're valuing an oil company. In a traditional discarded cash flow valuation, what do we do? We estimate the number of barrels of oil you produce each year, multiply by an expected oil price, come up with expected cash flows, discount them back at a risk-adjusted discount rate. We come up with the value for the oil company, right? So let's say you're the manager of the oil company. So you've got these, this 10-year project. I've put an estimated price. What do you get to observe each year as the manager? You get to observe the oil price, right? And do you think there's a feedback effect from observing the oil price? If oil prices are high, what are you more likely to do? Do more exploration, produce more oil. If oil prices are low, you adjust your... In other words, you're not an autopilot. You should not be. Do you see where I'm going next? If you do a discounted cash flow valuation of a commodity company, you will tend to undervalue it because what you're missing is the fact that the managers of that company can adapt their behavior to what they see in the market. That's a big change, right? Because when I valued Vale and I came up with the DCF value, that was just the DCF value. I'm saying there's a premium on top of it, and that premium is going to depend on what? Not on the company, but how unpredictable oil prices are, because that uncertainty is what's going to drive the value of the option. So this is something that's going to let us abandon traditional intrinsic valuation for some companies, but you can already see how it can very quickly get you into, into danger. Because if you're adding premiums on, you've got to be careful that you're adding it on for companies where this learning and adaptive behavior actually adds value to your investment. So that's going to be what we're looking for. So let's go back to options 101. You, you saw it in foundations. How many of you have taken the futures and options class? Okay, so you've seen this in, ex in, in extreme detail. But let me cut to the chase on the three questions I need to get answered for real options to come into play. The first is, I'm going to ask, when is there an option embedded in action? When should I even be talking about option pricing or real options in investments? So I'm going to start with that. How do you know there's an option? What is it that gives away the optionality? The second question I'm going to ask, and this to me is the key question where a lot of things that look like options drop off the table, is when does this option have significant economic value? Because the answer is no to the second question. I'm just going to stop and say, why am I wasting my time? And third, if I want to value that option, I need to use an option pricing model, right? So I'm going to ask, when can I use an option pricing model, Black-Scholes, binomial, whatever option pricing model I want to value an option? So let's start with the first one. When is there an option embedded in a decision. To answer that question, think about the features that make an option an option. The first is, it's a derivative asset. What does that mean? It cannot live on its own. It has to suck energy from something else. There has to be an underlying asset. So if, I, if you tell me something is an option, you say, what's the underlying asset? And you say, I don't know. There is no option here. So the first thing you need is an underlying asset. The second is, Options have contingent payoffs. What does that mean? On a call option, what has to happen for you to actually make money? The stock price has to exceed the strike price. That's what I mean by contingent. Something has to happen for the payoff to kick in. So there's got to be an underlying asset. There has to be a contingent payoff. And there has to be a finite life. In other words, I can't give you the right to this option for the rest of eternity. It's got to be three years, five years, 10 years. So those are the three things you go looking for to call an option an option. And I'll give you an even simpler way to identify an option. And you've all seen this at some point in time in some finance class. You know what gives away an option? It's payoff diagram. You're saying, what the heck are you talking about? Basically, if I draw the payoffs on an option, it looks very different from almost every other investment. And what makes it very different is this kink around the strike price. So if this is a call option. If the stock price is less than the strike price, the most I'm going to lose is what I paid for the call. That's what makes it an option as opposed to a futures agreement or a forward agreement, is I get the right, not the obligation, to buy at a fixed price. If the stock price exceeds the strike price, of course, I get a payoff potentially unlimited because the stock price could go to infinity. So on a call option, this is what I'm looking for, is a basically a fixed loss and an unlimited profit. 
If you have a put option, of course, it gets flipped around. Because I get the right to sell at a fixed price. If the stock price exceeds the strike price, I lose what I paid for the option. If it's less than the strike price, I gain money, but the profits are not unlimited because your price cannot go below zero. So it's bounded, but it's bounded at zero. So here's what I'm looking for, and this is what you're going to see me use every time I make an argument about a real option. I'm going to show you the payoff diagram. And if it looks like this, I'm going to say, we have an option on our hands. We have to think about valuing it. But I also have to identify what the underlying asset is and what the contingent payoff is and what the life of the option is for this option to actually have value. So let me put this on the table. There's lots of optionality. Our lives are full of options. The very fact you're here means, I mean, you, you get a job offer. You are, in fact, exercising an option, right? And if you're comparing two job offers, they might have the same pay, but one might have more. So options are all over the place. So it's easy to see options if you're looking for them. So the second question is where? You really have to spend your time. And the second question says, is basically asking, when does an option have significant economic value? I'm going to give you the one word for me that allows me to separate when an option's argument has substance from when it doesn't. The word I use is exclusivity. Know what that means? If you and only you have the right to do something, you have exclusivity. The further away you get from that, the more dangerous it becomes to use a real options argument. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Let me throw a few real options examples at you, and you can see exactly what I mean. Let's say you're valuing a young biotechnology company, and the only thing it has going for it is a blockbuster drug working its way through the pipeline. This optionality, right? Because if the contingent payoff is if it gets approved, you could make a lot of money. Is there exclusivity? If so, where does it come from? It comes from patent protection. Is it complete exclusivity? It gives you exclusivity on this particular drug, but not every drug to treat. So if you're coming up with a new drug to treat diabetes, your particular compound that you created might give you exclusivity, but if other people are, so it's exclusivity with a qualifier, which means if you're a monopoly pharmaceutical company, optionality works great, right? You're complete and total exclusivity. The more competitive this business becomes, if you have 15 pharmaceutical companies all working on drugs for the same disease, the exclusivity starts to wear down. Let's take another argument, and this is something we'll talk about as well. Let's say that I make the argument that we should invest in China because of optionality. Why? Because it's a big market. What's the weakness of that argument? Am I the only one who sees China as a big market? Maybe I'm the only one with the, oh, 1.2 billion people. Everybody else in the world is completely blind to it. Everybody sees it, right? And unless I have exclusivity, that's not an option. The title for my paper in Real Option, which is on my website, is Opportunities Are Not Options. Because I see people using the argument of, hey, this is a big market, there must be optionality. It's a young startup, there must be optionality. What they're missing is the second part of the question, which is, where is the exclusivity? So under what conditions can I use the options argument with China? What type of company do I have to be? I have to be a company with some kind of exclusivity that might come from a license. So if I told you that I have an exclusive license from Beijing to build hotels in Southeast China, there's an optionality argument there. But let's say, look, there's a lot of people in Southeast China. That's why I'm going to build the hotels there. There's no optionality there. So exclusivity is the word that you're going to use. And if you can show me that exclusivity, we're almost home. Because then I know you have an option. The option is significant economic value. And for 45 years in finance, we've been building up option pricing, and we know the six variables. And there are only six, and you're going to see why, that drive the value of an option. Three of these variables relate to the underlying asset. As the value of the underlying asset goes up and down, the value of every option will also change. So that's the first variable. So if I give you the right to buy something and the value of the asset goes up, your call options became more valuable because you got the right to buy at a fixed price. If I gave you the right to sell something at a fixed price and the value of the asset goes up, the value of put options will decrease. So the first variable is the value of the underlying asset. The second is the variance in that value. And this is where 
if you talk about real options, you've got to abandon everything we've talked about for the last 20 sessions. Up till now, whenever I've talked about risk, it's been a bad thing, right? In discounted cash flow valuation, risk pushed up, pushed up my discount rate, pushed down my value. In relative valuation, risk made me give, pay a lower multiple for earnings or book value or revenues or whatever variable. But the minute I talk about options, risk becomes my ally. We talked a little bit about this at the very start of the class. Let's make sure we affirm why that is. What is it about options that makes risk your ally? I'm sorry, what? But that's stating the same thing. What is it? What, what kind of risk do we usually worry about? Upside risk or downside risk? Downside risk, right? So what is it about these payoff diagrams that makes you feel much better? The nature of options is I've floored your downside risk. That's why risk is your ally with options. It's as simple as that. You don't need an algebraic proof. If I make your downside risk go away, then risk is now a good thing. So in the case of options, increasing the variance in the value of the underlying asset will in fact make options more valuable. If there are any dividends that I expect to get, or get on that asset, it'll affect me as an option holder. Let's see why. Let's make this very simple. Let's suppose I have a call option on a stock that pays a big dividend. Tomorrow is an ex-dividend day. You know what happens to the ex-dividend day, right? You have a $50 stock, it pays a $2 dividend. On the ex-dividend day, roughly speaking, what should happen to your stock price? It should drop down by $2. Otherwise, people will be making money hand over fist. So you can see already that if you're a call option holder on a stock that pays dividends, that call option will get less valuable the bigger the dividends are expected to be over the life of the option because those dividends will translate into lower prices. In fact, this is actually an argument that some people have used for why buybacks have become more popular than dividends. Because if you compensate managers with options, you see how you've already tilted the scales because when they pay a dividend, the stock price goes down. The argument is they buy back stock because they have options and options are hurt by dividends. So you're going to pay less in dividends. There are two variables relating to the option. One is, of course, the strike price itself. The right to buy something at a lower price is worth more than the right to buy the same thing at a higher price. And the more time I give you to play this game, the more valuable options become. The only macro variable that determines the value of options is what your risk-free rate is. Why? Because I give you the right to buy something at a fixed price five years from now. When interest rates are high, the present value of what you have to pay becomes much, much lower. So as interest rates go up, call options will become more valuable because you're going to have to pay less in present value terms and put options will become less valuable. So those are the only six variables, and all option pricing models try to build around those variables. Now, I know most of you just look at option pricing models, get intimidated, and move on. But I don't want that to happen, because option pricing models are not complicated. They're taken over by Greek alphabets. But there's actually a very simple rationale that drives all option pricing models. All option pricing models are driven by two very simple finance principles. The first is what the, the principle of replication. You know what that, what that means? If I create something that looks just like the option, it has exactly the same cash flows as the option, I've replicated the option. So the first step in option pricing is creating what's called a replicating portfolio, composed of the underlying asset and either borrowing or lending. Every single option pricing model is built on replication. The second principle is arbitrage. Where does that come in? If I create two investments which have exactly the same cash flows, what does arbitrage require their prices to be? They have to be the same. That's it. If you get that, you've got option pricing. And that's effectively what every option pricing model tries to do. So let's do some very basic option pricing. And to see replication arbitrage pop up, you're and the reason this matters is if I want to use an option pricing model then, then the replication, the arbitrage assumptions have to hold which means I've got to be able to trade the underlying asset and trade the option. Easy enough to do if you have a call option on a stock. But remember that biotechnology example that I gave you? The underlying asset is the drug that comes out of this approval process. You can't trade that. The option is the right to that drug. You, you can buy and sell that, but it's not widely traded. You can already see why real options become more difficult to apply and price because you don't meet those two requirements. 
So the way I would start replication was using what's called a binomial model. And you can see very quickly why binomial models bring home replication much better than the Black-Scholes model, which is more widely known. Here's the basic principle. I can create something that looks exactly like the call option by borrowing money and buying delta shares of stock. That's telling you nothing. You say, what's delta? That's one of the things you have to answer in the option pricing model is what the delta is. I can create something that looks like the put option by selling short the underlying asset, taking the cash, and lending it out. So almost every option pricing model is about how much should I borrow if I'm doing a call option, how much should I borrow, and how many units of the underlying share do I have to buy. So let me show you a binomial model because it kind of illustrates this replication arbitrage process. So let's assume you have a stock that's trading at 50 right now. So that's all you know. It's today's price. Let's assume over the next two time periods, this is what I think will happen. In the next time period, the stock can jump to only one of two points, 70 or 35. That's why it's called a binomial model. There are only two possible outcomes at each stage. And you'll see in a minute why I have to make it only two. If it goes to 70, in the following time period, it can go up to 100 or drop back to 50. If it goes to 35, it can jump to 50 or drop to 25. I give you a call option with a strike price of 40 that expires at t equal to 2. So right now, this is where we are. Stock price is 50. I've given you a call option with a strike price of 40. Let's make this simple. If you exercise today, how much money would you make? You're going to make 10, right? You were going to buy it. For, so basically, buy it 40, turn around. But this is an option. You have two time periods to play. Might as well let yourself play. And what are the three possible prices? You can end up at 150 and 25. So let's see what the cash flows on this call option are at expiration. Because that's the only time you know with certainty what that value is going to be. So if the stock goes to 100 and your strike price is 40, you'll make 60. If it goes to 50, you'll make 10. If it goes to 25, you'll make minus 15. Why not? Because you have the right to buy at 40. And if the stock is at 25, why the hell would you exercise that right? So basically, it becomes 0, 60, 10, and 0. What's my objective? I want to create a replicating portfolio that has exactly the same cash flows as a call, composed of two variables. How much do I borrow? How many shares of the underlying stock do I buy? So I'm going to make, make this almost an algebraic problem. Let's say the amount you borrow is B, and the number of shares of stock you buy is delta. I know you're saying this is algebra. I left it behind you know, 15 years ago. Pull it up again. It can, maybe it'll come in useful. So let's say the stock is at 70. I want to combine delta and B to have exactly the same cash flows as the call. So if the stock goes to 100, 100 times delta, and I'm going to repay the borrowing because I borrowed the money with 11% interest rate, 100 times delta minus the borrowing with interest should be equal to 60. If the stock goes to 50, 50 times delta minus 1.11B has to be equal to 10. Two equations. Two unknowns. You have two equations and two unknowns, and you sit and stare long enough there, sooner or later, the unknown should be known. So basically, it's simultaneous equations to solve. And it's a very simple simultaneous equation. The delta is 1. The B is $36.04. What does that even mean? If the stock goes to 70 and I go out and borrow $36.04 and buy one share of stock, that replicating portfolio, if the stock goes to 100, will give me a cash flow of 60. If the, if the, if it goes to, if the stock goes to 50, it will give me a cash flow of 10. I've replicated my call option. How much did it cost me to replicate? Well, I had to buy one share of stock at 70, borrow $36.04. So it cost me $33.96 to create that position. And because of arbitrage, the call option has to be worth $33.96. Do you see now why I had to start with the last branch and move backwards? Because the last branch is the only time I know the cash flows. I'm essentially solving for delta and B. So I've created the value for the call option. I do the same thing at 35. I come up with the value for the call of 499. Now that I have the values for the calls, I can work backwards one more step and ask the same question. If I went out and bought the shares today and the stock goes to 70, 70 times delta minus the borrowing has to be equal to 33.96. If it goes to 35, 35 times delta minus the borrowing has to be equal to 499. Again, I solve for delta and B. And if today I go out and borrow $21.61 and 
And buy 0.8278. Don't even ask me how I buy 0.8278 shares of stock, if I can do that. I've created what's called a self-financing replicating portfolio. You see why it's self-financing? If the stock goes to 70, it's going to be worth 33.96. I can use the 33.96 to create the next replicating portfolio. And the value of the call today has to be equal to the cost of that replicating portfolio. It's $19.42. I know it's a little tedious to go through this, but if you really want to understand option pricing, spend a few minutes on it. It's not really difficult once you break through the numbers and you'll see what we're trying to do here is the replication and the arbitrage. Now the problem with binomial trees is I give you a chance to go to only Now let me stop and ask, why did I ha have to make it a binomial tree? How many unknowns do I have? Two. Have you ever tried solving for two unknowns with three equations? Don't do it. You're going to have nightmares because in a sense, if I have three equations, you're going to end up with variables that might not be identified because you have three equations. So I had to make it a binomial tree because I have only two unknowns, delta and B, which also means that I'm a little restricted because for, to have any chance of having a binomial tree in, in, in the real world, I have to make time really, really, really short, right? Let's make it a second. Maybe if I do it in seconds, in the next second, IBM stock price can go to only one of two points. That's plausible, right? I give you a three-month call option on IBM and ask you to draw a binomial tree with time measured in seconds. You ready? Sit down with a really big sheet of paper, really fine pencil, start drawing the tree. Tiny little branches. So you're a really, really detail-oriented person and you draw every branch. I won't even ask you how many branches there will be in this tree. There'll be hundreds of thousands of branches. So let's say two weeks later I come to you and you've drawn this really elaborate tree. Can you almost visualize this tree with tiny little branches? Just hang in there with me. Let's assume you take the sheet of paper you drew and turn it on its side. You know what it's going to look like? It's look, going to look like a Christmas tree with no branch, right? Because you've got the binomial tree drawn. Now smooth out the outside of the Christmas tree. What does it look like? I know it's getting close to Christmas. Come on, you can visualize a Christmas tree, smooth out the outside. Okay? You've got a normal distribution. If you take time and as time gets smaller, you make the price changes smaller, the limiting distribution for the binomial is the normal distribution. The Black-Scholes model is a special case of the binomial model. If you make time short and you make price changes small, it's called continuous price distributions, the Black-Scholes model becomes the binomial model. I'm sorry, the binomial model becomes the Black-Scholes model. But is that a reasonable assumption that as time gets shorter, the price changes also get shorter? What am I assuming will never happen? I'm assuming that prices will never jump, right? That in the next moment, the price can't go up $10, and that's unrealistic. We know prices jump in short periods. News items come out, price jumps. Scandal, price drops. We are assuming that you can never have those price changes when we do a Black-Scholes model. That's why Black-Scholes models consistently underestimate the value of deep part of the money options. Do you see why? For a deep part of the money option to become in the, mo in the money in a Black-Scholes world, the price has to move in tiny little pieces. If I don't let prices jump and you're 20% below the stock price, it's going to take a lot of work for you to get above. So when you take the Black-Scholes model and value deep out of the money options, you will end up with too low a value because of the underlying assumptions you make with the Black-Scholes. But the Black-Scholes does simplify the world because it basically says the value of your option is a function of five variables. The value of the underlying asset, the strike price, the life of the option, the riskless interest rate, and the variance in the log of the price. Little detail. What do I do the log of the price? In fact, whenever you do a Black-Scholes variance, you're supposed to take the log of the price. Sounds like an inside options thing, right? Why do I use the log of the price? I'll give you a clue. What was the distribution that I built this off? The normal distribution, right? Can prices ever be normally distributed? Why not? The lowest value a price can take is zero, right? What's the natural log of zero? Minus infinity. 
That's basically it. That's why we use log prices, is it makes life convenient for us. It says, oh, there's a chance it's going to be normally distributed. So, so the next time you see somebody using the log of the prices to come up with the standard deviation, ask them why. Most of the time, they'll have no idea. The reason is very simple. It's to give you a chance at the normal distribution. But here's a, here, I'm, uh, there are only five variables in the original Black-Scholes. When I listed variables, though, I had six, right? What is the, what's the missing variable in the Black-Scholes? In the original Black-Scholes, I have only five, but I said there were six variables. If you want to go back and look at that page, you can. What's the missing variable? There are no dividends in the Black-Scholes model. You know why? There's a legend of how Fisher, Black, and Myron Scholes actually derived this model. I mean, they were both at the University of Chicago, and they were struggling with coming up with a close-form solution to this equation that was the Black-Scholes equation. Remember, the Black-Scholes predated the binomial. So this equation, nobody had ever seen anything like this in finance. It sits on their desk for months. Until a physics PhD student was walking by. In Chicago, I guess, PhD students wander all over the place. Walked into their office, don't ask me why. Looked at the equation and said, oh, we see this in first year physics. It's a stochastic calculus equation, and here's the answer. So the Nobel Prize should actually have gone to Fisher, Black, Myron Scholes, and an unknown PhD student in the University of Chicago. But they had to struggle so much to get a closed form solution that they decided to get rid of dividends the way economists get rid of problems, which is to assume it away. So the original Black-Scholes was designed for what are called dividend protected options. You say, well, how the heck would that work? Remember what I said, you have a stock price of 50 and you pay a $2 dividend, the stock price is going to drop to roughly 48 With a dividend protected option, I adjust your exercise price accordingly. So if your exercise price was 40, I make it 38. I say, you, I've been unfair to you because it's div there is no dividend protected option anywhere in the world. But the Black-Scholes was de designed for dividend protected options. And with a dividend protected option, I'm sorry about all those question marks. Those should show up as sigmas in your, in your lecture note packets. Okay. Here's what you do in the Black-Scholes model. The value of a call shows up as the value of the underlying asset today, the S, times n of d1, I'll come back in a minute and talk about what n of d1 is, minus ke minus rt times n of d2. The way I describe the black shoulders, it makes you use all those virgin buttons on your calculator. You know, once you've never touched the natural log, you say, who the heck uses that? e minus rt, oh, that's a crazy looking thing. All those buttons, if you take a look at your calculator, they're brand new because you, the PV button's all worn out. Black Scholes says, use it now. That's why you had to buy that calculator and pay $100 for it. But here's what you do in the Black Scholes. You take the variables, you plug them into an equation. And people do it mechanically. You come up with D1 and D2. You go to a table. Looks like this. It's called a cumulative normal distribution table. As opposed to what? In most statistics books, there's a normal distribution table. But it gives you the height of the distribution at every point. A cumulative normal distribution table gives you the area under the distribution. And if you look at the table, the lowest number you can get for this, for this cumulative distribution is 0, and the highest number you can get is 1. And already I'm going to give you a way in which you can make an intuitive leap from that number. That's like a probability. And that's the best way to think of n of d1 and n of d2, and especially n of d2, is it gives you a probability. You're saying, probability of what? n of d2, roughly speaking, is the risk neutral probability that your option will end up in the money. Let me repeat that again. You get an N of D2 of 0.71. I'm saying there's a 71% chance your option will end up in the money. In fact, the best way to kind of get an intuitive grasp of the Black Scholes is to think in terms of the replicating portfolio. The Black Scholes has the replicating portfolio embedded in it. In the, in the Black Scholes, if you ask me to replicate a call option, I'm going to go out and buy N of D1 shares of the underlying asset, and I'm going to borrow KE minus RT. And let me, let me explain what the E minus RT is. The strike price, you don't have to pay till the expiration of the option, right? Is that always true? Can you exercise an option before expiration? Yeah, most options you can. Those options are called American options. The Black Shoals was designed to value what are called European options. It's got nothing to do with geography. So don't think if you go to Europe, every option is going to be European. Okay? 
European options you can exercise only on the expiration day. You're saying, so what? So let's say expiration date is two years from now. You have a strike price of 50. Ke minus RT is just the present value of 50 brought back two years because you don't have to pay it for two years. So I don't use E minus RT to do present value. Normally we don't because we work in discrete time. Discrete time in what sense? When you did your DCF valuation, your cash flow in year one happened one year from now. The black shows is continuous time. If you don't have an exponential button on your calculator, just use a traditional present value. You'll be surprised at how close the numbers are going to be because that's what the KE minus RT does. That's called the replicating portfolio. And almost everything in option pricing is built around that replicating portfolio. Let me explain. See that option delta N of D1? As the stock price changes, do you think the option delta will change? Yeah, stock price goes up and down. As, a, as the time to expiration changes, in fact, that's called the option gamma. As the time to expiration changes, will the delta change? Yes, that's called the option theta. Every single Greek alphabet associated with option pricing has something to do with how that replicating portfolio changes as the variance changes. That's a vega. They, I told you, they've hijacked the Greek alphabet entirely. Theta, gamma, everything has to do with how will that replicating portfolio change, but it's built on the notion of a replicating portfolio. So I'm going to close. I know we're running one minute ahead, and, but this is my last thing. There is a way in which you can take the traditional black shoals, which did not allow for, for, for dividends, and adapt it to include dividends. And all we're going to do then is assume that the dividend yield over the life of the option stays fixed. So if you have a 2% dividend yield, so when we start on... Monday, we'll start with this equation because this is the equation that's going to allow us to value real options because almost every real option has a dividend component to it. through the industry dummies in? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I didn't consider, I didn't think about the two values. Yeah. Anyway, so I want to read you. Okay. Uh, so, my couple of tips, is there some sort of I R did... squared between the two spirals? No, it's not the R squared. Just look and make sure the T's are And rather than pick every sector and throw it in, maybe you want to just pick one or two and make it a dummy variable. But then don't you care so the other one? Oh, so just... Yeah, because in a sense, five of them, you might say, not much difference. Technology looks like it's crazy. Right. So I'm going to throw a technology dummy into the regression, right? So free cash flow to equity. Right. So I want to choose an industry that I think will have more correlation to, will, will affect more free cash flow? No, because let the free cash flow, you already control for free cash flow in your regression, right? So what the industry variable is capturing is things you're not capturing with your fundamentals, okay. right? So if you already have free cash or equity, in your regression, you don't need an industry dummy to capture. What the industry dummy is capturing are things you did not capture with your fundamentals. So you might throw in cash flows, growth, and risk, and you say, you know what? People are crazy. They see the name tech in a company, they push up the price 30%. That's what the dummy variable is capturing, is what the fundamentals could not capture. And that's why they're a little dangerous, because let's say that people are being faddish, that are attaching a 30% premium to any company which has the word technology in its name. Then you're going to get a great-looking T-statistic, a great-looking R-squared, and your predictions for tech companies, they're all priced just right, right? But they're priced just right because you've built into the pricing this irrational component. So you've got to be careful about drawing the line at adding a variable that might improve your R-squared from recognizing that you have a mission to take advantage of people's mistakes, right? So when you add those dummy variables, that's what I'd like you to think about is, is that dummy variable bringing in something that I should be worried about fundamentals? So the reason to bring in a technology variable is you might say, look, technology companies have shorter lives. Maybe because they have shorter lives, their multiple should be different from non-technology companies. That's an intrinsic value factor. I'm capturing that with the technology dummy, right? Okay. So, you know. It's, uh, basically, start with just regular one. See what the, if you get a lot of skewed 
outliers, that's really a signal from your regression saying there's something wrong with your data. So for instance, if you find a subgroup of all low P, P ratio companies come in as undervalued, and all high PE companies come as overvalued, you got a distribution which basically is a curve around the line, right? So you fit a straight line through something that has a curved relationship. So that's what you're looking for. Look at the output because that will kind of give you if your regression is kind of...